IT management from Webster University. He's going to be speaking about BGP flow spec. Yeah, as I said, my name is Justin Ryber, and I'm a, a senior systems engineer with Juniper Network, so I have to apologize. I am a sales engineer, but hopefully you won't hold that against me. Um, <laughs> I'm here today to talk a little bit about DDoS mitigation uh, using BGP flow spec. I don't know how many of you have, have taken a look at that, um, but it's an interesting technology. I, I, I feel personally like this is a, a, a useful tool in the mitigating of DOS attacks. So I'm just kind of here to present the idea and hopefully a call to action to get everybody to kind of read about it, play with it, and uh, give feedback not just to uh, not just to, your, to Juniper, but whoever your, your router vendors are um, on what's working for you and what's not working for you. What can we as an industry do better to make the, make the solution better? So um, just real quickly, I, I assume that you probably would have left the room if you didn't think DOS attack was an issue, but it, just some stories that I dug up that I thought were, were interesting talking about some of the more recent, uh, well, not real recent. These are actually all last year um, DOS attacks that took place. Uh, there's been plenty of examples since then that have taken place this year. Uh, the one I find actually the, the most interesting is kind of this NBC News article at the bottom talking about the actual real revenue impact of DOS attacks. So in addition to it being uh, something that's, uh, I guess, annoying or, or a hassle for those of us who have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to do the troubleshooting and the, and the blocking and the fixing of, of these type of attacks, it also has really economic, economic impact. Uh, to the industry as well. So it's a problem that we've got to, got to figure out a way to solve for. All right, so how do we, before, uh, before some of the newer tools came out, how do we block DOS attacks back in the old days? Um, so back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when you were going to block a DOS attack, uh, this was kind of the method you had. So I, have, I follow basically the same diagram throughout the talk. On the left here, you have all of your, your miscreants that are sending your attack traffic they're coming through, I apologize, they're coming through an internet cloud, right? Um, ultimately, they wind up in this example service provider's network. Uh, the service provider has a customer who's an enterprise company that has a web server living in their data center that's under attack, right? Um, so the enterprise customer is running BGP with their service provider. They're advertising a slash 24 block that contains the host address for their web server. Uh, of course, via BGP, that's propagated out through the internet. That's how these, uh, this, these miscreants, these bad behaviors, bad actors know how to send the traffic through the service provider's network and to the server. So how did, how did we used to be able to block DOS attacks? The enterprise customer, once their web server was under attack, they had to call their service provider and say, help, I'm being attacked. Uh, hopefully, they got a hold of somebody at the service provider's knock who had both knowledge on how to block an attack and had the proper access uh, in the surf riders network to be able to do that sort of thing. And they would log in manually and put an edge filter in each one of their devices to block this attack, manual ACL. And the attack traffic is blocked at the edge of the surf riders network, the web server's back up, and everybody's happy. This is fairly easy to, to implement, assuming that your NOC employees are familiar with the CLI on your given vendor's device. Uses fairly well under, understood con constructs. Uh, it does require a fairly high degree of coordination between the enterprise and source writer. That call has to take place every time you're under attack, so it's very reactive in nature. Um, and obviously, in this small example where the source writer only has three routers, that's fairly easy to do. If you think of a huge global service provider um, that has thousands of routers, this is not that, uh, not that scalable to log at every one of them and manually create an access list, right? And anytime you have your employee, your, as a service provider or a network operator, anytime you have your employees manually logging into the CLI and making changes, the chances for a misconfiguration and creating a filter that didn't do what we thought it was going to do exist and could be, you know, a, a problem as well. So then the next thing that we came up with um, as an industry was this concept of destination remote triggered black hole. And the idea here is to try and be a little more um, proactive in how we, not, not, not proactive, but to more dynamically respond to the DOS attack as opposed to having to manually log in and, and create the access list filters. So the idea here being that when the enterprise customer is under attack, they advertise a BGP prefix to their service provider that has the specific slash 32 uh, for their web server with a special BGP community that their uh, service provider will accept and in turn 
take that route and rewrite its next hop to a discard route so that the traffic is black holed at the edge of the service provider's network and the attack goes away. Now, the, um, th this is actually based on IETF uh, RFC 3882, which was ratified around 2004, so it's been around a little over 10 years. Um, it's not a, not, not a new concept as far as technology goes. Uh, it, it works fairly well. It does require the pre-configuration of the discard route on the service provider's edge network, so we have a route with uh, which we can rewrite the next hop to. The disadvantage to this approach, however, is that we're blocking that entire IP address. So not only are we stopping the attack traffic, but we're also stopping the legitimate traffic that's destined for this web server. Now, um, that does minimize the collateral damage if this enterprise customer has an entire data center and they have servers that are sitting next to this that are on the same subnet, and all of those were down because of the volume of this attack across the circuit. This will help with that, but it does take that one server offline you could potentially change your DNS entry to a different IP address, but if the attack is coming in destined to the name as opposed to the IP address, then the attack just starts all over. So there are pros and cons to this approach. The next thing that uh, we came up with as an industry to try and solve for this is what's called source remote triggered black hole. Similar idea in that you still advertise, a, it's done dynamically through BGP with an advertisement. Um, in this case, we're going to block the source of the, the attack instead of the destination. So the, when the enterprise is under attack, again, they call into their service provider and say, help me, I'm being attacked. The NOC uh, actually creates the, the route on their route server and push that out to all of, their, out, all of their edge devices. And what they're actually pushing out is a BGP prefix, like I said, for the source address. They rewrite the next hop to a, a route that's pointed at discard and then use uh, URPF or source address validation to detect that that uh, address it needs to be black holed. So essentially it's black holed based on the source of the, of, the, of the traffic and not the destination. And the, the attack goes away and in this particular case the web server is still up for everybody but the source that we're blocking. Right? Again this is uh, based on a standard, it's an RFC which was ratified about six years ago. So again not, not brand new but uh, a, a newer idea than the previous one. Again, it requires some pre-configuration because you need this discard route and you need to turn on um, reverse path forwarding on all of your edge interfaces, on all of your edge routers. Um, the, again, the victim's destination address is still usable, so it does have that benefit over the previous method. Um, but the, the downside of this being if you have a truly distributed DOS attack that's coming from hundreds or thousands of sources, this is not real scalable. You'd have to have a separate route for every single one of those sources, so um, that's probably not, uh, not possible. So in a BGP flow spec, this was kind of the next in the evolution of the ideas and how we mitigate DOS attacks. The idea here um, is that we're going to use BGP and create a new NLRI. So the, uh, the IETF created an RFC called uh, BGP for the BGP flow spec. It's 5575. It was ratified in 2009 and it defines new BGP NLRIs, AFIs and SAFIs, for advertising the flow spec information through, via BGP. And what happens is the, the flow routes are received by the edge routers. They validate it um, against the unicast routing table, the idea being there to try and keep from somebody who doesn't own the, the address block sending in a flow spec to block traffic that they don't have the authorization to block. Right? Um, once we check the validation, then we create a firewall filter, an ACL, however you want to phrase that, and push that down to the forwarding plane and actually filter the traffic. Right. Um, in the BG, if you look at the, if you go out to the IETF's website and take a look at the RFC, you'll see these are the type of things that you can include in this new NLRI for BGP flow spec that you're going to advertise. Right. So there's a lot of different things here besides just the destination IP address or just the source address that we've done with remote trigger black holes. We have things like protocol types. We can do ICMP codes. We can do source and destination ports. So it gives you more of the granularity that you had back in the old days with ACLs where you could figure out, you could get very surgical with what traffic you're going to block. And then as far as the actions you could take in addition to blocking the traffic, which is all you could really do, well, I mean, I guess you could have manually done it with access list other things, but um, the idea being that we can not only block it, which, which we set a traffic rate to zero, we could also rate limit it. 
uh, to a certain rate. We can sample the traffic to try and figure out where it's coming from, what the sources are. Um, we can redirect it to a route target, put it inside of a VRF. Uh, we can mark it with a different QoS. So if we don't want to rate limit it, we could mark it as low priority traffic so that once we get to a congestion, it gets dropped, whereas legitimate traffic uh, would have a higher priority. So there are a number of different things you can do and what you're supposed to do, what the edge device is supposed to do with the traffic is specified by a BGP extended community similar to what you do, um, let's say like a route target on a VRF. Um, it's important to note here while I am employed by Juniper Networks and we do support this RFC uh, and this technology is not just something that, that Juniper does, it's not proprietary to us. Uh, there are a number of, and I, I just put some examples up here, there are I'm sure plenty of other examples as well, but for, as far as de detection tools, uh, there are a number of detection tools that support BGP flow spec, these just being a couple of them. Uh, and there's also at least the three major, in my mind, the three major router vendors out there uh, now have support for BGP flow spec. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that the industry, I think, as a whole is trying to adopt and trying to, to push forward. All right, so we've sort of alluded to this, but to, to circle back to this point, what is it that makes BGP flow spec better than what we had in the past? And it really comes down to we now have the same granularity as far as how we, how we define the attack as what we had with access list, right? We can use all the, the end tuple and the packet headers to be able to, to block it as opposed to blocking an entire destination address or an entire source address. Um, but we get the same automation and the same dynamic uh, blocking of the traffic that we were looking for with remote triggered black holes, right? And then on top of it, we're able to leverage the BGP best practices that as an industry we've developed over the last, I don't know, say 20 years or so. Uh, all the policies, route maps, uh, in, inbound filtering, outbound filtering, all those things that we've been doing with BGP for years, we can reuse that same, uh, all those same mechanisms for the filtering of these routes. So how, do, how would a DDoS mitigation look if we were to use flow spec for it? Um, I have a couple examples here. In this particular example, the first one, the enterprise customer uh, and the service provider have agreed that they're going to, to allow the enterprise to send BGP flow spec routes to the service provider. Uh, in this particular case, we're gonna assume for a second that the attack is a DNS attack, a UDP 53 attack. Uh, they want to block just that, but they want to al obviously allow web traffic to come through so that their web server can still be up. So they create a BGP flow spec route. They send it to their service provider saying block all UDP traffic towards my one destination. And the service provider installs that route in their edge routers with an action set to rate limit the traffic to zero, basically block it. So the DNS uh, UDP 53 traffic is scrubbed out, the legitimate web traffic is still allowed to flow uh, to, the, to the web server. This allows the customer of the ISP to actually initiate the filter. So they, once the, the session is established and, the, and all the pre-work is done, once the, server, once the enterprise is under attack, they don't have to initiate a call, they don't have to even get the service provider involved to be able to block this. So it gives the tool uh, in the hands of the enterprise customer. Obviously, if you're a service provider looking at this, you're thinking, I need to have some controls around this. I'm not just going to let my customers wide open send me flow spec routes and, and block traffic in my network. Um, so you are going to have to have some sane BGP filters at your edge, uh, probably max prefixes. Maybe you only want each customer able to send one route at a time. Uh, you only want them to be able to send a slash 32 and not block their entire block. Uh, you may only want to allow them to send uh, a certain block that you know belongs to them. So there's a number of things you can do just using your normal um, route map and, and ing ingress filtering at the edge. Here's an example of what an edge router configuration would look like across Cisco, Juniper, and Alcatel. Um, I won't go line by line through this. I don't know if you guys are familiar uh, probably with at least one of these three OSs. The idea here is just that we're turning on BGP flow spec and LRI on the BGP session uh, between the service provider's edge router and the enterprise's edge router. Um, the other interesting thing to note is in uh, Juniper actually implemented BGP flow spec before the standard was ratified. And once the standard was ratified, there was actually a different way to order the terms when we create our firewall filter and push it down into our ASICs. 
So if you're wanting to follow the exact standard to have interoperability between the three vendors, you need to have this last statement that says that you want to follow the RFC standard way of ordering the terms. All right, so a lot of service providers don't have a level of trust of their enterprise customers that they would allow them to send these BGP flow spec routes into their network. So this is another way you could still use flow spec um, to, to block these attacks, but in this case, it's something you would use, that the service provider would use just in their own network, so within their own span of control. Again, we go back to the, point, to the, the type of, of mitigation where the, server, the enterprise customer has to call the service provider and ask for the attack to be um, blocked. The NOC then configures a flow spec route, in this case on the route server, pushes it out to their edge routers. Again, it sets the action to the rate that limit the traffic to zero or block the traffic, and the attack traffic is scrubbed out. The legitimate traffic is still allowed to flow. The end result is the same as the last example. It's just a matter of how the, where the route comes from and who actually initiates the route that's different in this particular case. Um, again, this could be initiated, I'm saying phone call, but it could also be initiated by an automatic detection system that the service provider is running in their network as a service. Um, or they could also create some sort of customer portal where the customer can log in and say, hey, I need a, I need a flow spec route injected into your network and it, has to have, you know, it needs to have these parameters because I'm under attack. So you don't necessarily have to do it by phone call. There's obviously some other methods that you could use for doing that. But regardless how, whether it's done phone call, uh, detection tool, or through a portal, there's still this coordination that obviously is going to have to take place between the enterprise customer and the service provider. And this is what the, the, again, the edge router configuration um, in the service provider's network looks very similar, except that on this, we're turning this on on the session toward the route server, not towards our enterprise customer. And then on the route server, it's very similar. We're turning on the flow spec, and we're creating a, a, an export or a route map that exports the flow spec route. And then uh, on the route server, this is how you actually create the flow spec route in Cisco and in, in uh, Junos. Today, Alcatel doesn't support creating and initiating the flow spec route as far as I'm aware. Uh, that may be new functionality they've added since I put these slides together. But at the time I put these slides together, there was no way to do that in SROS. But in, uh, in Junos and in iOS, this is the way you would create the, the route, the flow spec route, and export it across your BGP session. And you'll notice in this one, uh, once it matches the attack traffic that we're wanting to scrub out, we're setting the, the action to be a discard in this case, or a rate limit of zero. Um, another thing we could do with BGP flow spec, instead of just blocking it at the edge, is we could actually redirect it through a scrubbing center. So if you have um, a relationship with a company who does scrubbing, whether it be an Arbor or Prolexic, which I guess is now owned by Akamai, one of these type of DDoS mitigation services, um, in my mind, there's still a, a, a use for flow spec for you, even though they're doing the mitigation for you, because you can then dynamically route the traffic back through their, through their network using PGP flow spec. So the idea here being that the, um, the enterprise customer calls the service provider, at, says they're under attack, has the service provider again create the flow spec route on their route server, advertise it out to the edge routers, but this time instead of setting it to a rate limit of zero or a block, they're actually going to set the action to redirect. And they're going to redirect it to the scrubbing center uh, provider that they have, have a pre previous relationship with. That scrubbing, scrubbing center provider then is going to scrub out the attack traffic using some sort of DPI appliance or however their secret sauce is that they scrub out attack traffic and send the legitimate traffic back over to the enterprise, uh, the legitimate web traffic that needs to hit their web server. Now, obviously, to keep from having a routing loop in this type of setup, either between the service provider and the scrubbing center or between the scrubbing center and the enterprise customer on one leg or the other of that, you have to have a tunnel, either a GRE or VF tunnel, some sort of tunnel so that you don't create uh, a routing loop in the network once you re-inject the legitimate traffic. Again, just like in the previous example, this could be done through a phone call, through a web portal, through some sort of detection tool. Um, it allows a little more granular scrubbing of the traffic even than you can do with BGP flow spec. Um, again, the, the configurations across all three of the router vendors are very similar. Uh, on the route server, we're turn, or on the edge routers, we're just turning on flow spec towards our route server. And um, on the route server, we're turning on flow spec and exporting these flow spec routes. 
In this particular case, though, you'll notice when we're creating the flow spec route, um, instead of setting the, the, the action to be a discard, in this particular case, we're going to change the next hop uh, to rewrite the next hop and point the traffic to the scrubbing center so that the traffic goes up through the scrubbing center. All right, so if I'm doing, um, if I'm doing flow spec and I've turned it on on my, on my network, whether I want, no matter which of these three vendors I have, how do I know it's working? So here's some example commands that uh, you can do to see whether or not flow spec is actually, looking, uh, actually working. Uh, so you can look at the flow spec routes actually being advertised, sent and received via BGP. Uh, you can look at the corresponding firewall filter or access list that was created based on those firewall filters and then you can actually look at, also look at the counters uh, to see if there are any hits against that firewall filter one, or that access list once it's created and, and pushed down to the, to the forwarding plane. All right, so this is all great. Uh, where are we as an industry going? Um, there's still work ongoing in the IETF around uh, BGP flow spec. So this is not the end of the road, if you will, for this technology. There's still a lot of, a lot of additional feature and functionality that's being added by, by the IETF. It's owned by the IDR working group within the IETF. You're familiar with how the IETF is, is organized. Um, and th these are kind of the, th there are others, but these are kind of the three that I think are the most interesting to follow as far as RFCs or drafts that are being ratified. First one here is to add IPv6 support. So some, you know, someday there's probably going to be a major DOS attack that comes in through an IPv6 network, and today we don't have any way to mitigate that using flow spec because we don't have uh, we don't have the proper defined NLRIs to do I to do flow spec over v6 and to do the v6 uh, header definitions. So we're, that's being added. Um, relaxing validation. So there's a lot of interesting use cases um, that providers could use if they could better relax the validation that I talked about to, against the unicast routing table. Uh, things like route servers that may be in a different autonomous system than the majority of their network. A lot of larger service providers may have uh, their tools in a different AS that has an external session into the, into the production network. Um, so there's a lot of different things that uh, relaxing the validation and then validating or authenticating that these routes are coming from a trusted source is done via route policy instead of by just the, the validation mechanism that was originally specified by the flow spec RFC. And then the third one is to add additional IP actions, redirect IP actions that you can do. So you can redirect it to VRFs, um, but there's some other uh, IP actions that we would like to be able to take where we don't have to necessarily have it inside of a tunnel if all the traffic's gonna stay within a service provider's network. So there's some additional functionality that we're adding as far as new communities to do different types of, of redirect actions for flow spec routes. So what is the state of the usage of BGP flow spec or sort of the state of the union with this? Is anybody using it? Have they adopted it? Um, if I did a survey and, and kind of asked the community, I sent it out to the Nanog mailing list, I sent it out to all the other SEs at Juniper and asked them to kind of poll their customers to figure out, you know, what, what do people think about flow spec? Are they using it? Do they like it? Do they not like it? Um, I don't have enough time here today to, to, to show the whole survey revolt, the results, but if you want to see them, uh, my talk from Nanog 63 in San Antonio is out on YouTube. You can go and check that out. The survey results are in that talk. Um, but kind of the summary of the high points of that of that survey are, um, everybody seems to think it's a good idea. Uh, they definitely agree that figuring out a way to mitigate DOS attacks is something that's needed in the industry and that flow spec has potential to be that, that solution or, or the, that best tool. Um, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, enterprise customers, your content providers like your Netflix or your Googles or your Amazons um, are waiting for their service provider carriers to allow them to send flow spec routes into their network. Uh, some of them even said in the survey, which I found kind of interesting, that they would be willing to switch service providers if there was a service provider out there that supported it and their current service provider didn't, they'd be willing to actually use that as a reason to switch service providers. So maybe there's a way to make actually make money on this uh, if you're a service provider, right? Um, when you survey the service provider community, what you hear is that they're waiting for their vendors to support it. So, there is now support across Cisco, Alcatel, and Juniper, as I mentioned. Um, some of those vendors are a more recent development than others. 
Uh, I think for all of the vendors, when it was first implemented, the quality or the scale or the stability was uh, lacking. So as time has gone on and the code has gotten better, the, f the bugs have gotten fixed, the features have gotten uh, more robust, I think every, uh, you know, with every passing version of code that's released by any of the three major vendors, um, you know, there's better, a better uh, flow spec implementation. So the service providers, I think, have been waiting to see a certain level of a lot of that happen before they deploy it. And I think now that we're there, hopefully we're going to start to see a lot more adoption of it uh, as an industry. At least that's what I hope we're going to see. Um, that's uh, all I had. I got the references in here if anyone wants to look at where I got some of this information or if you want to go out and read about the BGP flow spec uh, RFC itself. So that I think I got maybe five minutes or so for questions. If there are any questions about uh, flow spec. Go ahead. How, how far, I mean, if flow spec works from the customer to the ISP, there's nothing that prevents an ISP and another ISP to exchange those routes as well. That's great. Now, are we there yet? Uh, I mean, personally, I feel like the technology exists. Whether or not the service providers have adopted it, I think the answer to that is, is no. <coughs> I'm not aware of any major service providers that have <coughs> Because everybody knows that the optimal way to stop an attack is to be, it's to either not send it at all, or block it as close to a source as possible. Yeah. When you get that traffic at the provider, it has transited through a whole host of a whole big internet. Right? Yeah. Exactly. You know. So you know when you have a huge DNS attack that's like 400 gigabytes, you know, like everybody is impacted. So the fact that as an ISP you could tell the other. ISP says, hey, that's complete garbage. Don't send that to me at all. Right. But then how would that scale with you know, a huge amount of post spec routes now? Yeah, that's the problem is in, I mean, I don't know in, in Alcatel or Cisco's equipment what their, what their scale is, but our scale is at the point where I think we could do that globally, look at all the flow spec routes across the entire internet table. Right? We're not quite there yet. Do you know which ISP is actually supported? Uh, I do not know. My, my survey results were, were anonymous, so I don't know which service providers are, are supporting which ones aren't. As far as I know, there's no major service provider that is accepting flow spec routes from their customer um, <coughs> by default, I guess I should say. Hello, hey, John. Um, it's not that I missed the mic, I actually have um, So, I think you may know, but um, to give you an update, so one of the things that we've been doing is this community-based remote triggered black hole server sort of called others. And, um, we've, when we, we try to do flow spec with that idea in years past, and no one really took to it. But more recently, I think you may be interested in that. Probably at least 10 people who, um, who do the remote triggered black hole in the last have expressed a great interest to do flow spec. And there was one network, a small network, maybe not necessarily one that would be necessarily impactful for anybody, that just wasn't interested in doing remote trigger black holy. So when you, when you enable flow spec, please call us again. So we're going to do flow spec, that's actually the third priority. Can't say when exactly, um, but we have a number of people who are interested in, in doing it, so I'm feedback for you. Because okay. the people are just des desperately interested in seeing this sort of thing. What has helped the most, I think, is that now Cisco is starting to do this. So that a few people say, oh, well, now Cisco is supporting it, now I can start doing it. The one thing that we're, um, we're probably going to implement a subset of the feature set, so we have to verify routes because we're sort of this relay. So we're, we're going to limit what flow spec routes can be sent to maybe some subset of the tuple um, and restrict how many they can send because people are also very concerned about you know, TKM space, that sort of stuff. Yeah, sure. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully the next time you do this talk, I'll have even more to yeah, I mean, as Pete was mentioning in his, in his talk, right, access lists are a somewhat precious resource on your device, and opening it up to allow a customer to send you routes that are affecting the amount of access lists that are on your edge devices is somewhat of a <coughs> scary concept to a service provider. So, I mean, the good news is that you can do things like ingress route maps or uh, ingress policy in Juno Suite um, to limit how many you're allowed to send. So you can put a cap on that. <coughs> 
I don't know if Anita's here yet. I haven't seen Anita. She might have stuck out, but she might know more. But I know that this has actually been added to the new National Cybersecurity Initiative list of products and protocols that are going to be required in the future by providers for all DOD and government projects. All right, thanks everybody, thanks for having me.